Thank you all very much for coming along today and to the organizers for giving me the chance to come here and talk to you about what I do, why I do it, and what I think the um, interesting questions are. Um, it's also the furthest north I've ever, ever been in winter, so this has been um, quite an experience already. Um, but anyway, we can all think, um, try and warm ourselves up, think some warm thoughts for the day. In fact, I'd, I'd even like you to imagine a, a really, really hot day. Not just a, a nice hot sit in the Sunday, but one of those painfully, uncomfortably hot days. High 30 degrees, early 40s even, over 100 degrees for the uh, Fahrenheit people. Um, it was a day like that um, in a city called Hillsborough in Oregon on the 10th of August, 1996. There was crickets chirping. It was a blasting hot day, and everyone was taking refuge inside their homes and offices uh, with air conditioning on full, powered by power, going through lines like these. But power lines, of course, are made of metal and rubber, both of which get softer in heat, particularly when they're carrying high voltages. Um, so uh, somewhere along the alston Keeley line in Hillsborough, one of these power lines begins to sag. It's the fifth one to do it that day. It comes a little bit too close to a tree. There's a bright flash, and the line goes dead. Power is instantly rerouted to the neighboring lines. They were never designed to take the extra load and they're also struggling under the heat. So in under five minutes, they also fail. 13 nearby substations malfunction due to power surges and outages and a cascade of failures spreads across the entire West Coast grid, leaving nine US states, two Canadian provinces and even parts of Mexico without power for up to six hours. It's one of the largest power cuts the world's ever seen. Meanwhile, over on the East Coast, they were trying to grapple with the legacy of Gaetan Dugas. He was a Canadian-born flight attendant, and even though he died very young, uh, only 31 years old, during his lifetime, he's believed to have had about 2,500 sexual partners. Thomas doesn't even look impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I was impressed. You'd think that sort of thing would, would have made him a household name, but... Um, it didn't. He was, however, very well known to authorities who called him patient zero because he was believed to be the first person to bring HIV to North America. It turns out that he probably wasn't the first, but of the 248 cases of AIDS diagnosed in the US by 1982, at least 40 of them, so around a sixth, could be directly traced to sexual encounters either with Dugas or with people he had been with. And in fact, when the Center for Disease Control began recording um, sexual liaisons and practices among gay and bisexual men across several states, Dugas was found to be at the very center of that network. And that was why they initially believed that he was the, the first patient to have uh, this disease. Um, now, these two examples, although very different, are often cited in the literature on complex systems because they show how rapidly a perturbation and how widespread a perturbation can be once it hits a complex system. And we often study these kinds of systems as networks where each of the, the points in them, either a human in a, a disease network or a, a power substation in a, a power network, are depicted as nodes connected by some kind of a link. And a lot of these kinds of complex systems have a property of, of um, in colloquial terms, few degrees of separation. The, um, you can draw a, a line or a path among different nodes across the entire network relatively easily or with relatively few steps. So the network is highly connected. And it doesn't achieve this connectedness by every node being highly connected. In fact, many nodes uh, are relatively unconnected. For example, the average human being has between about 1 and 14 sexual partners, depending on their uh, race and um, ethnicity and, and, um, and year of birth and so on. Yet there are some extreme individuals like Dugas that have 2,500. And it's these extremely highly connected nodes that bring cohesion to the entire system. So it's those nodes that allow the spread of perturbations, but there's two actual, uh, two quite, um, or one Im quite important distinction between these two different cases. And that is that in the case of the disease transmission, we know that the probability with which an individual will catch this disease is correlated with their position within the network. And in fact, it's the, the same behavior that made Dugas an excellent spreader of the virus was also the, the behavior that made him much more likely than average to contract it in the first place. Highly promiscuous individuals have frequent exposure to sexually transmitted diseases and therefore are more likely to catch them and much more effective spreaders on, of them. <laughs>
In contrast, knowing how connected a power line is tells you nothing about the probability that a tree is going to come into contact with it. So where am I going with this? All of us um, are depend on other species for, for our survival. We are embedded in complex systems, uh, complex networks of interactions with other species that have many of the same properties as the two examples I've just shown you. Every meal we sit down to eat contains a variety of species. Each of those species depend on others, like for example, um, their, the food plants they feed on or their gut bacteria. Um, Plants depend in turn on pollinators or, or uh, below ground mutualisms. Um, plants also face enemies um, like pests or diseases and those in themselves have their own natural enemies. So we live in complex systems. We depend on these complex systems for our survival. And that's not just a um, kind of a throwaway comment. Literally, we would die if it wasn't for these interactions among species. And yet we know that about one in a thousand species is going extinct every year. Um, th this extinction rate is possibly a thousand times greater than historical or background extinction rates. So if we're losing nodes or, uh, um, or altering parts of this network, are we going to face the ecological equivalent of the West Coast blackouts? Are we going to get rapid spreads across the entire food web that, that literally could threaten our survival? So the kind of questions that uh, motivate me and that I think are some of the big questions for the future is trying to see if we can ever predict how perturbations will alter and, and spread across these complex networks of living organisms. Can we predict which species will go extinct? Are we always going to be bound to just describe what we've seen, to go out and measure the effects of change, or can we ever hope to predict those effects before they happen? Um, a related question is, is how far is a perturbation likely to spread? If a species is affected in, in one particular location, is it going to spread in that landscape? Is it going to spread across a whole continent like the power cuts? Is it going to spread further? What, where does an a interaction network begin and end? How far can perturbation spread across them? Uh, and once we know the scale at which these, these networks are functioning, how can we hope to manage those? There are a lot of um, difficulties in managing landscapes, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in a little while. And then all of the interactions among species that occur today are the legacy of millions of years of evolution and some co-evolution, and we've now disrupted some of those evolutionary relationships um, put species together that have never historically coexisted. So what's going to be the impact of these, or how can we first of all detect the signature of these evolutionary uh, impacts on ecological networks, and then how are the changes to networks today going to alter these evolutionary relationships? What will be the consequences of that? Um, and finally, if, if we're seeing changes to ecological networks, to what extent do they matter? How uh, is the architecture of these networks related to the way in which ecosystems function? I'll warn you now, I'm not going to be able to answer any of these questions, but I, I think these are some of the big questions and we're, we're trying to um, make some steps towards understanding them. So the first step, um, which is kind of the, the baseline, is to try and document some of the changes that we observe. How are ecological networks responding to environmental changes? Um, and I just want to give you a couple of examples of, of things that we've seen. Um, this was some work done with um, Dani Garcia in uh, Oviedo in Spain. Um, and we looked at the invasion of plant frugivore networks. And because invasive species are often quite generalist, we saw that they increased the connectivity of these networks and altered various other um, aspects of their architecture. We also ran some uh, warming and nitrogen addition experiments back home in New Zealand, and we looked at um, plant herbivore parasitoid food webs. We found that um, warming and, and nitrogen addition tended to make networks that were heavier in the middle, so they, um, the herbivores won out, um, and the, the plants gained a little bit. Herbivore populations grew enough to offset the benefit to the plants, and the parasitoids couldn't keep up with the growth of the herbivores. So um, we started to see food webs that were heavier in the middle. Um, we also saw changes or, or rewiring of interactions because parasitoids started searching for hosts that were the ones, the species that did best out of the changes. So we started to see stronger preferences um, coming out in choices of who would attack whom. So 
it's, it's relatively easy within the scope of a three-year PhD to describe those kind of changes. But it's much more difficult to predict them before they happen. So one of the things I, I want to talk about now is how can we go about trying to predict how perturbations might alter the architecture of ecological networks? Um, and there are a few different approaches that you can potentially use to try and do this. And I just want to um, illustrate some of those briefly. Um, this was some work I wasn't involved in, but by my colleague, uh, Daniel Storfer. And he showed that the um, that you could make, or he wasn't using it specifically for prediction, but he showed that the, the role of species in their network, the position they occupy in terms of um, the... I won't go into great detail, but the motif structure for anyone that works on networks um, was was conserved across different locations. And also he used dynamic models to show that the um, impact of a species on its community was also conserved across locations. So the um, presented here as the tendency to benefit a community within New Zealand. These were some data from New Zealand um, stream food webs. You would get a positive relationship with the tendency to benefit the community um, elsewhere in the world. And that conservation of roles and of, of impact on the community was conserved um, at all levels of biological organization from families right up to phyla. So if the role of species is conserved from place to place, then we hypothesize that you should be able to predict the impact of an invasive species or, or the, the role of an invasive species in a new community based on its home range community. And this was some work led by Karini Ema um, and the group of Jane Mehmet. Um, and we looked at pollination networks, data sets from around the world, and we found that for a lot of um, measures of individual species role, and I'm using the term role very generically as their, their kind of position within the network or, or the way in which they interact with other species, um, their role in the native range was a significant predictor of their role in the invasive range uh, in a lot of uh, network metrics. So uh, the, the conservation of species roles from place to place might be one way that we can begin to make predictions about change. And we could use things like species distribution models, um, which predict species um, range shifts, and then couple that with knowledge of their interactions in their home range potentially to predict um, interactions in the future. Now, environmental changes also don't impact species randomly. They impact them based on their traits. And we find that uh, various environmental drivers can filter out certain kinds of traits or filter out species based on their traits. And here's an example of some work um, using pollinator networks in New Zealand uh, along a, a kind of a land use intensity gradient. Um, and the y-axis is nest something called nestedness rank, which is just, um, you can view that as a higher number means a species is more likely to be lost in the more intensified habitats. Um, and you can see that the larger bodied species were more likely to be lost, solitary bee species were more likely to be lost, and species that needed resources other than their, um, uh, other, other than just pollen and nectar were also more likely to be lost. <laughs> Sorry. So then, if environmental drivers are selecting species based on their traits, so filtering out part of the, of the traits of the community, how might that then affect how species interact with each other? Um, and this was a question that um, one of my students, Camille Cooks, looked at uh, for her PhD and tried to understand how um, the traits of species determined how they interacted in a network and whether there was a relationship between a species' contribution to functional diversity and their position within the network or their, their um, interaction traits. Um, and this is a, a little bit of a um, difficult figure to take in, but what it is, uh, each of these circles in that figure is a species um, and it's an ordination based on their traits. So species that are close together in that figure have similar traits to each other. We measured a whole bunch of different um, traits and these were of pollinators. Um, and the color of the circles indicates the number of interaction partners they have. So more red means that they have um, fewer interaction partners, more white means that they have lots of interaction partners, they're an interaction generalist. Um, and what we found was that 
um, species that have very different traits to others in the community, so those that are far away from other points or and also far away from the community average or centroid, which is the X in the middle of it, we're more likely to be um, uh, to interact with fewer partners. So you can see darker red colors the further they are from the, the clustering of points. So what this suggests is there's a, a trade-off between trying to have different enough traits to potentially avoid competition with other species of your trophic level, but if you become too different, then your interaction partners no longer recognize you as something to interact with, and you lose the ability to interact with them. So there's a trade-off between trait differences, which generate functional diversity, and the, the necessity to maintain interactions with the interaction partners. So if traits potentially can determine um, how many partners a species interact with, can they even predict with whom that species will interact? Um, and I just want to show you a couple of, of ways in which that's been shown to be an approach for predicting interactions. Um, the first one was a, a paper led by Anna, uh, Anna Eckliff when back when she was in Chicago, before she came back to Sweden. Um, and she used a, a niche-based approach to determine whether um, species traits could predict who they interacted with. So she took the idea of, of the niche being a, a multi-dimensional hypervolume, and she asked, how many dimensions of that niche do you need to know to predict who a species will interact with? So for example, you could look at one niche dimension, body size, um, and you could potentially envisage a scenario whereby every species has a body size and it feeds only on species within a range of body sizes and nothing else. So that species at the top might only feed on things, those red species which fit within a window of body size. So that would be one, one trait or one niche dimension explaining all of the interaction partners of that species. But it's unlikely that one single trait would be able to do it. So then she said, what if you added another trait? Um, like you keep body size, but then you also have, say, the depth at which a, a marine species feeds. And then could you, with those two traits alone, predict all of the species that, that a species would interact with. And she did this across a variety of empirical data sets where she looked at the extent to which knowing the traits of the species could predict their interaction partners. And um, she found lots of cool stuff, but one of the take-home messages was that knowledge of species traits gave you good predictive power for who would intera uh, interact with whom. And it sometimes it took far fewer traits than you might think. So even body size alone could predict the interaction partners in between 11 and 100% of cases. So in some networks, you could purely, based on body size, predict who would interact with whom. Now, of course, the traits of species have evolved through time, so you would expect, and people have demonstrated, there are phylogenetic relationships in who interacts with whom. So related species of one trophic level um, tend to interact with related species of another trophic level. This was some work I was not involved in um, by Enrique Rezende and colleagues in Spain. Um, and they showed that um, this was for um, plant and mutualist um, networks, so plants and either pollinators or seed dispersers. Th there was this pattern whereby the phylogeny of the plant matched up with the phylogeny of the animals. Um, so that phylogenetic congruence indicates that there's some kind of a shared evolutionary history that related plants have been interacting with related pollinators or seed dispersers. Now, that can potentially be used as a way to understand the changes that were occurring now if that pattern of phylogenetic congruence is changing. And um, uh, there are now some examples starting to come up where, in fact, environmental drivers alter this pattern of phylogenetic congruence. You get changes in the extent to which related species interact with one another. And if, th if the related species are no longer um, interacting with other related species, so the phylogenetic congruence is breaking down, that suggests that historical evolutionarily conserved relationships or, um, or co-evolved co relationships are now being replaced by more facultative um, associations among species that don't have a shared evolutionary history. Um, and we found um, uh, with Blas Lavandero, we looked at this um, using within species phylogenies, so genetic distances within um, individuals of a given species. Um, we've also seen it at the species level in a, a, some work led by Guadalupe Peralta, 
um, looking at, along a habitat edge gradient that when you moved from natural forest to plantation forest, y you got changes in the, the phylogenetic congruence. And Marcelo Eisen and colleagues have shown that also for pollinators along a fragmentation gradient. So there seems to be a um, growing evidence that the, the strength of um, phylogenetic congruence among interacting partners is being altered by changes to the environment. And I think an important new avenue of research will be understanding the evolutionary implications of those changes in the long term. Now, you can also potentially make predictions of who, um, of who might respond to environmental change based on their location within the food web. Because for a long time, we've known that, for example, um, habitat specialists are more vulnerable to processes like habitat fragmentation. Um, and that can be mediated by, um, as we heard from Elizabeth, the necessity for a host plant. So you might expect that trophic specialists are more vulnerable to processes like habitat fragmentation. And then this work led by Marcelo Eisen from Argentina, um, we looked at a, a gradient of fragment sizes, which were actually sierras or um, kind of hilltop plateaus in the agricultural matrix. And as these plateaus got smaller and smaller, the plant pollinator networks got smaller and smaller, and we were able to see whether characteristics of the species in the larger fragments predicted their probability of being lost from the smaller fragments. And we found that um, two characteristics were important for predicting uh, the loss of interactions, and that was interactions that were rare or interactions among uh, specialists tended to be the first to be lost. And that was even if the species involved in those interactions still persisted, they were less likely to interact um, in the smaller fragments. So you can potentially, um, with some very easy to measure um, characteristics of species or of interactions, predict their probability of being lost. Right. So what that result suggests is that as we move from patch to patch within a given habitat, um, you're getting a, a filtering of certain interactions. Uh, and that filtering is, is somewhat consistent. You're losing the same interactions based on their characteristics. You're also, um, we've known for a long time, losing species based on their characteristics. Like for example, uh, as we've already heard, their dispersal characteristics can determine the probability that they'll reach different patches. So we can think of um, networks as occurring in in meta communities whereby the um, species are moving among patches um, and connecting all of these different sub networks, that movement is not random, it's determined by the traits of those species. We also know that the traits of the species determine who they interact with. So there's likely to be some, some very important ground to be gained by trying to combine the systematic filtering of traits by the environment with the importance of traits for determining which species interact with which others. But that's even if we only consider patches of a single habitat in a landscape. But in fact, landscapes are made up of lots of different kinds of habitats juxtaposed or um, sitting adjacent next to each other. So then if each of those habitats has its own little dynamics like that, but also um, there might, uh, there might be differences in networks across habitats. What does this mean for landscapes as, as ecological networks? So the first um, step in trying to look at this was seeing how, um, how interaction networks changed across different habitat types. And this was, um, these networks are kind of aggregates of many sites. Um, we had 48 sites in total across a land use gradient in Ecuador. Um, the parasitoid host interactions, the top rows are parasitoids, the bottom rows are their hosts, and the, um, whatever you'd call them, things between them uh, indicate a trophic interaction that between the parasitoid and the host. So the width of those interactions at the top indicates how frequent that interaction was in the community. Um, and what you can see along this intensity gradient is the networks moved from being having very even interactions in the native habitats through to having um, uh, uh, networks that were dominated by just one or two interactions in the more modified habitats. So if habitats differ in their food webs, this raises a pretty important question if we consider that landscapes are actually just a whole bunch of different habitats sitting next to each other. So where, if each habitat differs in its food web, where does one begin and another end? Are each of these habitats just a 
independent little food web doing, doing its own business? Or are there connections among those that potentially interlink the different food webs and inter interlink their dynamics? So as a, a first step to answering this question, we, um, one of my uh, former PhD students, Guadalupe Peralta, looked at how food webs merge at the edge of two different habitats. So if you've got two different food webs sitting next to each other, what happens at the edge between them? Uh, she tested three alternative hypotheses for it. The first was kind of a, an unrealistic null hypothesis that the two habitat food webs just sit side by side and have no connections among the two. So it could be that each habitat is just an independent food web doing its own thing. More likely is that there's some kind of a mixing of the two, um, and she used null models, randomly sampling interactions from each of the habitats to generate hypothetical edge food webs, and tested whether real food webs um, fitted what you would expect just by random mixing of species and interaction. So what are edges simply the blending of two habitats um, randomly into each other. Um, and what she found was that neither of those was the case. In fact, edge webs tended to be um, significantly different from what you would expect by random mixing of species. Um, and this is one of the metrics she looked at, linkage density, which is the average number of interaction partners per species. Um, and each of these was a different edge that she looked at, a different, um, uh, in this case, it was a plantation forest next to a native forest. And she found that linkage density was always higher and in five cases significantly higher at edges than you would expect by random mixing of species. Now that could have been because species interact in a more generalist way at edges and she found that was not the case. In fact what it was caused by was that edges tended to systematically favor species that were in their internal habitats more generalist um, so you just got an accumulation of generalists at the edges, which meant that they were the food webs at the edges were more connected than you would expect at random. So on the one hand, this makes prediction difficult because edges are not random. We can't just uh, make predictions based on um, random sampling from different habitats. But if we know that there is some kind of... Um, consistent non-randomness, that you tend to get an increased um, proportion of generalists at the edges, this might help us to be able to start predicting how landscapes work together. Um, but that's assuming that edges are just kind of a, a border between two habitats, whereas it's quite possible that habitats are actually exporting species en masse from one to another. So there could be quite a high flux of species across different habitats. Um, and in fact, uh, a number of years ago, in a paper led by Tatiana Rand, who's now at the USDA in Montana, um, is uh, we, we hypothesized that you would get species flowing potentially between natural and um, productive habitats, but that this flow might not be symmetric. And the reason for that is because species can come into a crop habitat, but we, we grow crops, we've chosen crops because they grow quickly. We fertilize them so they grow quickly. We manage them so they grow quickly. So because crops are highly productive, over time we would expect them to have a strong bottom-up impact on um, herbivores and then on consumers of those herbivores, which then would spill over in larger numbers from agriculture back into the natural habitats. So essentially, because or if two habitats differ in their productivity, we would expect the more product productive habitat to be net exporter of um, organisms into the less productive habitat. Does that make sense? Cool. So um, one of my former PhD students, Carol Frost, decided to test this again at um, plantation forest, native forest edges. And um, the productivity difference was about twofold. So plantation forests in New Zealand, pi um, Pinus radiata, produce about double the biomass of um, native forests. Um, so we predicted that you would get a net flow of consumers from pl um, plantation forests into native forests, and that's exactly what she found, um, that you got approximately two-fold higher movement of both generalist predators and also specialist predators, um, parasitoid wasps, which lay their eggs either inside or, or um, on a, a larval caterpillar. So there was asymmetric movement across habitats from the more productive to the less productive habitat. Now, 
that opens up some interesting possibilities because if you've got consumers moving from one habitat to another, those consumers have been eating hosts or eating um, herbivores in one habitat and then moving on into another. That means that the herbivores in the plantation forest are building populations of enemies that affect um, herbivores in the native forest. And that's um, a, a process termed apparent competition whereby um, the, uh, the population size of one species affects the population size of another via shared natural enemies. So we might predict that this movement of, paras uh, of, of predators across the habitat boundary could drive apparent competition between those two habitats, could link the dynamics of species uh, in those two habitats. Um, so this here is a parasitoid overlap graph, and each of the nodes here is a herbivore species, a caterpillar, and the links between them indicate that those two herbivores share a parasitoid species. The blue ones here are native forest herbivores, the red ones are plantation forests, some of them are the same species, if they've got the same number, some of them are different. Um, and the blue links here indicate a native forest caterpillar sharing a parasitoid with a nati another native forest species. Um, the red links indicate a plantation forest caterpillar sharing them with another species in plantation. And all of the gray links indicate sharing of parasitoids across the two different habitat types. So species are sharing lots of their enemies across those two habitats, and there's a f net flow of enemies from one habitat to another. You might expect that the dynamics of all of these species will be influencing each other, so that the entire landscape or the multiple habitats next to each other will be functioning as a single network. So you could take that a step further, and Carol did, and, and actually make predictions based on the extent to which different species share parasitoids with each other. So you could say, if, for example, this species there increases in abundance, lots, it should feed lots of parasitoids and therefore those parasitoids will go out looking for hosts and you would expect higher attack rates on every other host species that shares parasitoids with that one. Does that make sense? So what she did was extrapolate that across the entire network and say how would changes in the abundance of every host species translate into changes in attack rates on every host species across the two habitats. Um, then she measured it over a season. She looked for natural changes in host abundance, and she also generated some artificial changes in host abundance by um, flying over in a helicopter and spraying about 20 hectares of plantation forest to remove the herbivores. So she had very large and, and small, more natural changes in host abundance, and she predicted how those changes in host abundance would translate into changes in attack rate across the whole community. And she found that you could not only significantly predict changes in attack rate across the whole community, but you could just as easily predict them within a habitat as you could based on linkages across different habitats. So the two different forests were essentially functioning as one single food web. There was no barrier to apparent competition across those two habitats. And she even showed that these changes in attack rates were related to changes uh, in abundance of those host species. Yikes, running low on time. Um, so then the last point I want to make um, about how uh, about landscape processes and, and food webs is that when we go out and we study food webs, what we do is we record a bunch of interactions occurring at a given location. So we go out, maybe we collect some hosts and rear out their parasitoids, or we watch some flowers and see what pollinators visit them. But that thing that we put together and we call a food web is really an artificial construct. Because you might be grouped, depending on how long you sample for, you might be grouping together species into a food web that never actually coexist with each other. It might be that one species occurs early in the season and another one late, and then we shove them in together and we call something a food web. So a food web is in fact dynamic through space and through time, and when we study them, what we tend to do is just aggregate them um, all into one single unit. Um, so one thing we looked at a few years ago was does this aggregate is this aggregation representative of what the food web is really like, and do changes uh, in the environment alter the the extent to which food webs are dynamically variable in space or time? So these are the 48 food webs from parasitoid host webs from Ecuador that I showed you earlier. Each point here in this ordination is a food web. 
from a given site. And the um, ordination is based not on species and their abundances, but on interactions, pairwise host parasitoid combinations and their frequencies. So two points that are close together in this ordination mean that the food webs had the same interactions occurring at the same frequency. Points that are far apart had very different interactions occurring at different frequencies. And the shapes and colors of the point indicate their, um, which habitat they came from along this gradient from less to more intensified. And um, the f first thing that screams out at you is you could just about draw a line through here to separate the more from the less intensified. Um, so you've got very different interactions occurring at different frequencies in the more modified habitats. But more interesting than that is if you look at the spread of points in the different habitats, you can see that the more modified habitats are all clustered together, which means that you could go from a site of, um, of pasture, drive for three hours to another pasture or a, a rice field, and you'd see the same interactions occurring at the same frequencies. Whereas if you went from one forest to another, you would get a completely different set of interactions. And we saw the same thing occurring in time as we saw in space here. So if you sample a rice field on one day and come back um, a year and a half later, you'll see the same interactions occurring at the same frequencies. Whereas if you sample a forest, on different occasions, you'll get completely different interactions. So land use intensification doesn't just alter the average structure of a food web, but it alters the, the turnover of that food web in space and time. And if you think about, again, those food webs occurring within a landscape, then some of those are undergoing more rapid turnover than others, um, and all of those are influencing each other. And they're influencing each other in ways determined by the traits of those species, which determine the way they interact with each other, as well as the way they um, move through these different patches. So there's a lot going on in these landscapes. But even if we knew the right thing to do, and, and to be honest, we often do know the right thing to do. We know that, for example, if you want to conserve species, you boost the amount of habitat in the landscape. It's a bit of a no-brainer. But why is it difficult to manage landscapes? Why can't we put our ecological knowledge into practice? And the answer is people, right? So people prevent that. People have economic objectives. People have social barriers to change. There are a lot of aspects of people being the species that we are that limit our ability to manage landscapes. So you could think of it as a landscape being a, a meta network or a meta community of ecological systems coupled with a network of social systems. Like these could be, for example, different landowners in dark gray, um, maybe different institutions in light gray, and each of those either individuals or institutions might be managing part of the landscape. So you could have, say, a conservation organization managing the natural areas, landowners owning their own farms. Um, and they potentially share information with each other, or um, in the case of organizations, they might legislate in ways that determine how landowners can behave and so on. So effectively, our complex spatial ecological system is really a complex social ecological system. And I think the, the next frontier will be understanding how human barriers, human drivers of change, determine our ability to alter landscapes in ways that generate positive ecological changes. So where are the, for example, the leverage points in the social network? Who are the, the people that most influence the behavior of others in a positive way? How can, we, how can we use those people to drive change? To what extent can you drive landscape change via legislation which is quite a blunt instrument, versus changing individual behavior. Um, I certainly don't have the answer to that, but um, one way of, of thinking about this, th uh, this was some data um, we had from the Netherlands. Um, in the Netherlands, you've got about five trading companies, um, supermarket wholesale traders, that service 16 and a half million Dutch people. So that means for every single, tr or every single trader in that food supply chain is connecting about 3.3 million consumers, like you and me, with about 13,000 producers. So uh, in the supply chain, you've got these pinch points where few individuals actually have enormous power over what is done further up the chain. Now this power could be used for good or for evil. For example, um, these traders 
could demand unsustainably low prices of produce, and that would force farmer behavior in a direction that would be bad for the environment. In contrast, we're now starting to see, um, particularly in the UK, um, supermarket wholesale chains joining together to demand more sustainable production by their landowners. And they're doing that for two reasons. The first is that consumers are starting to demand sustainable products. And the second is that if you're a trader, you don't just want food sometimes and not others. You need a consistent supply of food, which means sustainability is actually an economic priority for um, for traders and supermarket chains. So potentially these, these pinch points and social systems might provide a way forward for overcoming the tragedy of the commons and some of the limits to how we can actually design landscapes if we even knew the best way to design those landscapes. Now I think I'm out of time, so I'm gonna move through this last bit pretty quickly. Um, the last thing I w just wanted to say is that um, another frontier is trying to understand how the architecture of networks, or does the architecture of networks, relate to ecosystem functioning. And we might suspect that it does because um, networks depict the way species use other species, so the way species partition their resources among each other. And we know from all of the research on biodiversity and ecosystem functioning that the partitioning of resources among species is key for generating complementarity and positive biodiversity effects. So you might expect that when species have high complementarity in who they interact with, that you get better overall resource utilization and better overall levels of functioning. And this was um, something that one of my um, former students tested. Um, she used parasitoid host networks and looked at the complementarity um, in host use among parasitoids, and she found that this was positively related to network-wide parasitism rates. So it seems that the ideas from um, biodiversity studies and resource complementarity can potentially translate into network and interaction complement or trophic complementarity. Um, and she also found that um, trophic redundancy in the network could predict the spatial variability. So you could get spatial insurance effects driven by the ways in which different species used each other. Um, the downside of this is that, that functional or trophic complementarity comes from specialist species using different species to others. And I showed you earlier that the specialist species are more likely to be lost first. So potentially we're gonna lose um, ecosystem functioning more rapidly than you would expect based on random extinctions of species. And then the last thing um, that I wanna mention is that Previously, um, we've looked at biodiversity ecosystem functioning relationships, and what we've found was that across a range of different systems, from pollination to plant diversity productivity to parasitoid diversity and, and attack rates, we found that increasing resource heterogeneity tended to increase the slope of that diversity function relationship. When you have varied resources, um, diverse assemblages can partition those resources better and give you better overall biodiversity benefits. So what this suggests is that there might be some role of, of landscape structure, not in simply generating um, connections among ecological networks, but also determining the functional importance of those connections among species within a habitat and among different habitats. And that's, I think, a, a fertile um, area for new research to try and understand landscape scale, functional complementarity, and functional redundancy within ecological networks. So to sum up, basically what we have is long-term co-evolutionary processes determining which species interact with each other, in part via the traits of those species. Um, those traits of the species determine both who they can interact with as well as their ability to disperse from patch to patch. Um, then we've got patches of different habitats connecting each other in landscapes and potentially functioning as a single large ecological network. And that network structure is determined in a large part by social networks and social processes which um, dictate how people manage land. And all of these come together to generate the, the complex trophic species interaction systems on which we all depend. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think we've got time for questions. <laughs>